This prayer shall continually be in my mouth. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge my, and my strength. And I will say, In Him indeed will I trust. Hallelujah. Amen. We have no one else to trust, no one else to look to for help. When my soul needs manna from above, where could I go but to the Lord? Seeking a friend to help me in the end, where could I go but to the Lord? But when my soul need manna from above, where could I go but to the Lord? Yay. He's the only friend. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Yes, sir. He's our Savior. He's our Lord. He's our rock. He's our shield. He's our buckler. He's our soon coming king. He's the El Shaddai, the all sufficient one. He's Jehovah Jireh, the Lord that provideth. He's Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. He's Jehovah Tesikinu, the Lord our righteousness. Oh man, there's so much thing that we can say that, that sometimes we don't even have words. We don't even have words to, ex to describe, to express our feelings. We don't have enough words. We don't know what to say sometimes. As I say, we don't even know what to do with ourselves sometimes when it comes to God. But we know that He is our Savior. The most important thing, He's our Savior. He's our Lord. He's our God. And He's our soon coming King. He's coming. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His promises are yes and amen. They will not fail. Whatever God has promised you, He will fulfill. So keep thinking, keep holding on. Keep thinking about the good things of God. Paul say, meditate on the good things. Whatsoever things are good. Whatsoever things are honest. Whatsoever things are just. So if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, so think on these things. Good things. Don't let, don't let the weight of sin, uh, oppression or depression or uh, circumstances weigh you down. That you cannot rise up. Rise up in the name of Jesus. You know, stand fast in the liberty where he has made you free. Don't let sin entangle you again. It's your and it's bondage. Sin brings you into a, a place of like imprisonment, torment. It harasses you. It, 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 it binds you. But God has set you free. As he said about Lazarus, loose him and let him go free. So God has loosed us today. He has loosed us from that chain, that bondage of sin. And we are free. And if, and, and if the Lord God make you free, you are free indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. That's all we can say, your goodness, your mercy, your grace, your loving kindness and tender mercies. And you will live and move and have our being. You are our life. You are what everything. You're the lily of the valley. You're the bright and morning star. You're everything to us. You're all in all. So today we stand here in your, in your presence because of you. Because of the light that you have instilled in us. The love that has been shared about in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. We thank you for that love. For that fellowship. For that communion. So as we stand here, Lord, strengthen us. Anoint us again. It's not by might, it's not by power, it's by your spirit. Let your word that we speak, Lord, bring life to some soul. Touch, energize, deliver, help. Bring understanding, restoration. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Remember we are talking about the doctrine of justification. And we had said our subtopic last week. We started this subtopic, the righteousness of faith. So this is righteousness of faith part two. And we were dealing with Romans 4, and we read verse 5 to 8, and then we had read, we started from verse 13 to verse 18. So we're just going to recap briefly. Romans, Romans 4, from verse 5. But to him who does not work, but believe on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Let's go down to verse 13. And we can start there. Father promised that he would be heir of the word was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Through the 
righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and a promise made of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace. What? Righteousness. Therefore, righteousness is our faith. We can put that word there. That it might be according to grace. So that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not only to those who are of the law, but to also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him whom he believes, God, who gives life to the dead and call those things which do not exist as though they did, who, contrary to hope, in hope believe, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. We can stop there. Remember we, we had mentioned a word last week, Lajizan AI. It means to reckon, to consider, to impute, to count, to reckon whether by calculation, calculation or imputation. So righteousness is by faith. Uh, righteousness is imputed to us by God through faith. Imputation, Lajizani AI. And the amazing thing about this word Lajizani AI, it have a lot of, lot of credit to it, a lot of Significant state because it comes from the word logos. L O G O S. Logos in the Greek is the word for word. In English. English word for, for word is logos. And logos that we know is the, is the Christ. Logos means word, the word of God. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the logos. And the Logos was with God. And the Logos was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without, nothing was made without him. And then it said, and he was life. And his life was the light of men. So that we were walking in darkness. And the light came. And we could not comprehend it. But then go to the verse 12, John 1, 12. But as many as believe him, to them he gave power to become sons of the living God. As many as believe by faith, his righteousness has been imputed to us. As many as believe him or believe in him by faith are justified. Having therefore been justified by faith, hey. we have peace with God. See all, see all these things tying together? Because of the Logos. La Zezaniai. To reckon, to consider, to take inventory, to impute. In other words, no person seeks righteousness by faith unless they feel unrighteous. That is why Paul refers to the term, but believe on him who justifies the ungodly. You will not go to God if you are righteous in yourself. If you feel like you are righteous. You will not go to God. Now, why do you apologize? Because you feel guilty. You feel, you feel disturbed in your mind, in your spirit, in your soul. You feel like you have wronged an individual. But if you don't feel that sense of guilt, you will not apologize. If you think that within yourself you did nothing wrong, and you are upright and holy, you will not, you will not seek God for goodness, for mercy, for grace. You won't. So, that is why God gives us a conscience. You speak about conscience, right? God gives us a conscience, and your conscience bears that you are guilty. So because of that sense of guilt, you run to God. But when your conscience now becomes like overwhelmed by, it is overwhelmed by sin, but what I mean to point that you don't care anymore, you will, not, you will not repent. You will not seek God. So a person only seeks righteousness by faith, when they feel unrighteous, when they feel unworthy. And as I say, 
When God imputes righteousness, he also, along with that, brings a sense of awareness of your guilt and of your sin. So that now, you run to him for more. You won't, you won't feel satisfied in yourself. You won't feel contented. You must believe in him or on him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. On. And what does mean? on means? Put your trust in him. Reliance. Look to him for grace and for mercy and for salvation because you are unworthy. You want yourself to become worthy, so you must look to him that can make you worthy. The statement, faith is a country for righteousness. Remember, we talked about Abraham. Abraham believed God. And his faith was counted as righteousness. Genesis 15 verse 6, right? It means that there was no merit in Abraham as there also is no merit in us. Rather, it's faith that lay holds on the greatness of God since righteousness is not something that is due to us but is freely bestowed by God. So imputation signifies uh, impartation or uh, bestowal of grace and mercy and righteousness. You don't deserve it. The law sees you as guilty. Remember we were talking about the law, contrasting the law, works of the law, and the versions of faith. You will not be justified by works of the law because you cannot fulfill the demands of the law. The, 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 the bar is too high. It is beyond your reach. You cannot... Get over that barrier. Sin is a high barrier. It's an infinite barrier for us to or even surpass. Anyway, you cannot surpass it. We're going to see later. Why is that so? Why is so? But grace now comes by God's free bestowal. It is by grace that we are saved through faith. Grace is a mechanism. As I say, faith is the means. Faith cannot save you if there's no grace. You know, it's so, it's so funny. I was listening to a pastor one time from South Africa, and he was talking, and I, he made a statement. If I tell him he made that statement, I turn my mind away from that, what he was saying. He says that what you pray, what you say from your mouth, and what you confess, God will honor. That is neither here nor there. But then he made a statement. He said that the prayer is more important than grace. If I tell him make that statement, I say, you know what, you're talking stupidness. You're talking nonsense. Your prayer means nothing to God if there's no grace involved. It is by grace that you are saved through faith. Prayer is useless without grace. You can pray to God all you want, and if God doesn't apply grace, nothing will happen. In fact, he doesn't answer their prayer or the wicked. He will give no good spiritual gift to a wicked person. What, what sense does it make that God imputes or gives you a goodness, a spiritual benefit, and you continue in sin? What, what, what benefit would that? You know what, what that is saying? That God is, uh, God is uh, kind of rewarding you for your sinfulness. No, 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 no. Or God is like accepting you for your wickedness. No, 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 no. It doesn't work like that. The only way God is pleased with you is when you are righteous before him. When you repent of your sins, when you confess your sins, when you admit that you are rebellious and you are wicked and you are evil and you are obnoxious. And you say, Lord, I am wicked. I am vile. But you know what? You can save me. You can change me. You can redeem me. You can wash me. You can cleanse me. That is the only way that God will look at you and consider you. We can see in a minute why. There's, there's reasons for these things. So don't let people talk nonsense and you believe it. A lot of people just preach and teach, you know, and they don't have a knowledge of the truth. Or they're doing it for a reason. You know, my wife always said that whenever somebody speaks, they have their own agenda behind it. <laughs> so you, you, you got you to gotta know and see what they're thinking and how or what they want before you accept what they're saying. But my agenda is, is as Paul would say, it's not about me. It is Jesus and him crucified. That's all it is. Whatever the word of God says that pertains to life and godliness, that's all I, I, I care about. And I will speak about. I will speak Jesus and he crucified. 
I don't want to know nothing about anything else other than Jesus and him being crucified for my sins. Then for my sins. That is the most important thing. Listen, Pastor. If it's one foot, one eye, one hand, I want to go to heaven. With, with those one hand or one foot. So, so the, the, the physical healing is good, but it is not mandatory for me to get to heaven. Because as long as I die in Christ, if I believe on him, I shall be saved. If I, if I die with one dollar in my pocket or no dollars in my pocket, it doesn't matter to me. As long as I have Christ with him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. That is the only way I can get to the Father. Now, let's continue. Now, as we say, righteousness is by faith, but it does not mean that we are not supposed to be engaged in good works. When we have been justified by faith and we have peace with God, then God demands that we do work that is righteous before him. It, well, it, really, it really means that we walk righteously then. Whatever activity that we are engaged in is supposed to be righteous and bring honor, and glory to God. I cannot stand here and minister to you unless, first and foremost, I have been saved and washed in the blood, and God give me the unction, the strength, and the ability, and then I engage myself in doing this activity. It's, it's work. This is work, Pastor. Sure. You got to study. You got to read. You got to prepare. But you got to exert your intellect, your knowledge, your strength, your breath, your energy, and it all comes from God. That's the thing. You see, look it unto Jesus, yeah. who's the author and finish of your, our faith. Remember, he became the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. Remember that? So we obey by speaking the word. Verse 6, in verse from chapter 4, right? Where David was speaking, just as David also describes the blessing of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those who lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. You know something? We said that righteousness is by faith. So how come did, how come David believed in God? How come um, Paul speaks about David? Quote David, how come Samuel believed in God? But look at, look, look, we can go back to Moses because, I mean, Genesis is written by Moses. The first five books of the, uh, the Old Testament were written by Moses. How did Moses get this knowledge? This revelation? So how did Enoch walk with God to the point that he was translated? How did Noah find grace instead of God? But righteousness is by faith. So, how, so what are we saying? It, it, we are saying that it had always been God's plan and purpose that a person would be saved through grace and faith as the mechanism or the means. But you know what? But Christ wasn't revealed as Christ, as the Christ in the Old Testament. Many times he was referred to as the angel of the Lord or Jehovah. Or the Lord of Sabbath. Abraham believed in the Lord. And it was counted on him for righteousness. See. They had a revelation that. Is not by their own doing. Or their own merit that they will be saved. But they will look to another person. Who would be able to represent them before God. And remove their sin. So they had to have a revelation. Uh, a night of a coming Messiah. Someone that will come. And lay down his life for their sin. Remember Abraham made a statement to Isaac. The Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. So they had a revelation. So why? Because God revealed to them. It had to be a revelation. A spiritual insight. Verbal. By hearing God's voice in their ears. Or uh, uh, an impression on their spirit. A impression on their soul or in their minds. How can you write something if God doesn't in, God doesn't reveal that truth to no, you? No, 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 no. 
the Bible said that no. men of old, they wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit and they wrote the Bible. They wrote these things. But he wasn't known as Jesus. Because Jesus is a New Testament term. That name was revealed to Mary, right? Though she called his name Jesus. But Abraham knew him. Isaiah called him Emmanuel. God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. So you see, they had a heart of revelation of Jesus Christ. That righteousness comes true. And it comes by faith. That is God's standard. There's no other way. There is no other method that God uses to save a soul or save a person other than true righteousness of faith. In verse 6, just as David described the blessing of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works, the word that God imputes is not speaking about the righteousness of the law. Remember, it's not according to the law or the attempted obedience of man to keep the law. It's not talking about that. For then it will be righteousness according to works, which is not acceptable instead of God as a source of justification. Now, the point is this. If a man could keep the law perfectly, Pastor, he would attain righteousness, if he could. But he can't. The fact, the fact of the matter is that we are already a sinner. We are already born in sin and shaped in iniquity. We are condemned already. Mm -mm. So since we are under the condemnation of the law, the law cannot justify us. So I don't care how much we attempt to keep the law, it will not save us. But it doesn't mean that you must, you must not do right. Now here, this, this, this is, a, this is the, the quandary that we are in. God demands that a man be obedient. God demands that a man keep the law. God demands that a man does not violate the law. But you are already in violation. Don't think because that you're in violation, you can say, well, you know what? I'm a sinner, so therefore, I'm going to do more and more sin. No. I don't care. It, it doesn't mean that. All you're doing, brother, is turn up wrath upon wrath mm. for the day of wrath. God commands all men everywhere to repent. All men are under God's condemnation, subject to eternal punishment and damnation, but he still demands that you repent. But you won't. Or you can't without the Spirit of God giving you that unction. You're in a quandary, brother. <laughs> You're in a position, a precarious position that you cannot do anything about. That is, that, is the, that is the situation we find ourselves in. We are more concerned about everyday life, our sex, sexual orientation. What somebody addressed me as, our sexual pronoun. Now tell me this. What is a personal pronoun? There are some words that that makes sense in the English language or any language really. You know what people are doing today? They are bastardizing language. Language has no meaning anymore. If, and if language has no more meaning, then there's no meaning to life. You cannot understand anything. At the Tower of Babel, they were all speaking one language. That's right. And they began to rebel more and more against God. And God says, let me go down and see what they're doing. Because now, there's nothing that they, that they will attempt that they, they will not be able to achieve. Let's go there and confuse their language. God came down and confused the language at, at Babel. At Babel, how you want to pronounce it. And then they could not understand each other. Today, confusion is happening in the world because of language again. And it's a true demonic operation. But God is allowing it. See now, see the just shall live by what? The just shall live by faith. The just doesn't live according to man's whims and dictates. The just doesn't live according to the language of man. Remember, we are talking about the language of God. The just live according to the word of God. The Logos, Logis Omnii, imputation, righteousness, faith, hope, mercy, grace. That's how the just lives. By the word of God, according to the word of God. You don't need anything else. Because when you have the word of God in you, or you understand the word of God, you will see things in their proper perspectives. Nobody can bamboozle you and confuse you. So nobody can make me speak something I don't believe. I can tell this now. I don't care who 
come against me. Whatever they say, Pastor Peter, I will not bow myself down to unrighteousness. I will not be forced to speak something I don't believe. Whatever it costs me. I will not speak something I don't believe. Or that I know is ungodly and unrighteous. If you're offended, you're supposed to be offended. You know something again? Oh, I'm offended by a certain term. You see now, they don't understand the conscience. God is at work in you. Because if I speak something to you that is truth and it offends you, it means that you are in a place that you need to be offended. Because if you are not offended, you will not repent. So they can say, oh, he offended me by calling me by a pronoun that I don't know, that I don't address myself as. You're supposed to be feeling guilty because you are walking in guilt. You're walking in unrighteousness. So God allow words to bring guilt to your mind so that you know that you're wrong. How else are you going to acknowledge that you're wrong? So you see, they're talking something, they admitted something, but they don't even admit that they are, that they are being stupid. Because you're making a statement, you feel guilty, and you're trying to portray that guilt on the other person, when in actuality, you're supposed to put it towards yourself and repent. Amen. Repent. Amen. You see? How else are you going to know you're wrong? So that's what you're talking about. God makes you feel guilty so you can run to him for relief from your guilt. I don't care if I call you by any other pro. I know you're still going to be guilty. And you're still going to be condemned. You know, something offends you when you know it's wrong. You think if somebody calls me a Christian, I'll be offended? No. If I'll be happy. I'm a believer. Oh, those right-wing believers believe in an in a, in a ancient God. Ha! I'm happy, brother. That's your definition of God? That's not mine, but I'm a chosen one. I'm a royal priesthood. I'm a peculiar nation. I have been caught out of darkness into his marvelous light. Hallelujah. That's all I know. And that's all I care about. I know the thing about this is that at the end of the day, I'm, I'm going to be one of those that I'm going to lift my hands up and worship and praise before the throne. Ooh. And those ones are going to be, be, be behind the white throne judgment of God. And God is going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Enter, enter the hell, the place that was prepared for the devil and his angels. You go there. That's your place. You always make a statement that you, you don't want to be a signpost. Just standing up and giving directions to people that are passing by. A signpost doesn't move. But it gives, it, gives, it gives directions. You don't want to be a signpost. You want to give directions, but you also want to go along. You want to move along. So I don't only want to speak God's word. I want to live God's word. I want to operate in God's word. I, wa I want God's word to be allowed under my feet and like under my path. I want to go with God. I don't want to talk about God. I want to meet with God. Hallelujah. There's a difference. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I can speak to you about God all I want, but if I don't obey his word, I will fall short. And Paul said, I don't want to be a cast away. That's right. He said. I'm not going to just speak and don't do. And then at the end of the day, I'm a cast away. Mm -hmm. Blessed are those who Lord is, these are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is a man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Verse 8. Romans 4 verse 8. Mm -hmm. So now, as I said last week, I made a statement that justification can be seen negatively as God not imputing sins to us. As David stated. David started from a different perspective. The opposite perspective as Paul. Paul was saved from the righteousness of faith and the imputation of Christ's righteousness while David was saying that blessed is a man when God does not put sin to our account. Our sin doesn't uh, isn't placed our account. But, but it means that, obviously that if God doesn't place sin to your account, it means that it has to be removed. Either by imputation to Christ or by washing away through his blood. Some way or the other, it has to be removed. In fact, it, it happens both ways. So justification can also be seen negatively as God not imputing our sins as David states. Blessed is a man whom the Lord shall not impute sin. This simply is to be understood as if God does not 
imputes our sins to us, it means that in fact he justifies us, that he imputes Christ's righteousness. If God doesn't impute sin, it means that he takes them, and on the other hand, he gives Christ righteousness to us. It's a, it, it, there has to be an exchange. You know, it doesn't make sense again that God just removes sin from you. Because you need communion with God. You need fellowship with God. So you must replace it with Christ righteousness. See? He must fill you with something. He must fill you with the Holy Spirit. When, 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 when evil goes from you, the, the place must be, must be replaced or filled with righteousness. When hate goes from you, it must be replaced with love. Mm -hmm. See? When unbelief is removed from you, it must be replaced with faith. Mm -hmm. With believing. See? There must be a, a filling. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's the work of the Holy Spirit to fill us. To impart and to give to us the spiritual benefits that God put in place through Jesus Christ. David said, Blessed are those who Lord, these are forgiven, right? And whose sins are covered. So we're talking about two things, forgiven and covered. So our sins are said to be forgiven or remitted because there are debts that we owe and we cannot repay. So if you are forgiven, it means that it is a debt that God cancels because you were unable to pay it. So remit means to cancel. So your sins are cancelled, which is really forgiven, but they're also blotted out, are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what, that's what David is trying to say. And you see, that's a revelation, brother. Blessed is the man who loves these are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. So they are covered, and they're forgiven. To convey the idea to you that Christ has removed them totally, and they can never, ever, ever be placed to your account again. Christ paid for them. If a debt is paid and settled, the party that you owe, that debt cannot have a claim against you anymore. Because the debt is settled. You paid up in full. So Christ has paid up in full the requirement for our sin by the shed of his blood. Therefore, it is really called a blessing. Because you know what? When God removes sin, as I say, he gives you a spiritual benefit. You know, God will not give you a spiritual benefit when you are in sin. You cannot continue in sin and expect God to bless you spiritually. So it is really called a spiritual blessing since it is not ours by right. It is not yours that you deserve. By right, habit, or behavior, but is God gratuitously forgiving your sin and not giving what you really deserve? His eternal wrath. God will not give you any spiritual benefit when you will remain in a rebellious state. You're hostile to Christ. Christ is your sanctifier. Christ is the one that's going to forgive you of your sin. And you're hostile towards Him. You hate Him. You rebel against Him. How can God righteously or justly apply? Christ's work and benefit to you when you are hostile to Christ. You hate him. You believe in somebody else. You believe in Muhammad. You believe in Buddha. You elevate others above Christ. You worship Satan. You worship the creature more than the creator. And you expect God now to give you the benefits of Christ. A person will not receive any spiritual benefit while they remain outside and hostile to Christ. And this will remain the case until the sinner is actually justified, as God does not consider anything in a sinner as worthy or excellent or shows any special favor towards them while they are in a rebellious state. This remains the case until the sinner is actually justified, as God does not consider anything in a sinner as worthy or excellent or show any favor or pleasure towards them while they are in a rebellious state. This is the case for the following reasons. The infinite wickedness and nature of sin. Sin is a wicked thing and it's infinite in nature. The distance between man's sin and God's holiness is infinite in scope. He's holy 
undefiled, separate from sinners, and he, and he resides in the heavens, at heavenlies. So the distance between me and God, when, I'm, when I am in sin, is infinite. I cannot bridge that gap. God is holy and righteous. His holiness is infinite in comparison to our unrighteousness. There's no, there's no ability for that gap to be bridged in ourselves. Consider the sin then of the ungodly is as great in comparison as the distance in holiness is between God and the sinner, which is infinite in nature. Consider that the greater distance between God and the sinner, so much less is he worthy of God's respect. So since there's a great, vast, infinite distance between God's holiness and, and our sin, it means that there's an infinite lack of respect that God has for us. As, as, as God is holy and righteous, and we are unrighteous, so great is that awareness that we have in his presence or in his sight. While on the other hand, the love, honor, and obedience of Christ towards God is of an infinite value as it comes from him who is of an excellent dignity. So Christ now is holy and righteous and undefiled and obedient, but he's also in himself a, a divine person. So his worth in God's sight is also now infinite in scope. As we are infinitely unrighteous and unworthy in God's sight, Christ is infinitely worthy and holy and righteous in God's sight. Because of our unrighteousness, which is infinite, we need an infinite party to stand in our behalf. So we need a holy, righteous God to send his son who is holy and righteous so that Christ can stand in our gap to take away our unworthiness before God. Exodus 15, 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? So he is glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. So Christ's holiness, his obedience, his love in God's sight is glorious in holiness. He's worthy. He's excellent in praises. He's infinitely worthy in God's sight. While we are infinitely unworthy in God's sight. So we need that infinite worth of Christ to be placed to our account to make us worthy before God. Nothing else can work. Therefore, because of our infinite rebellion towards God, we need a person of infinite dignity and worthiness to answer for our unworthiness and disobedience. In other words, Christ is infinitely worthy as we are infinitely unworthy before God. Consider that all sin is of infinite aggravation and heinousness before God. Therefore, before the sinner is justified, they are under infinite guilt in God's sight. We are infinitely guilty before God. Infinitely. Not a little guilty. Not half guilty. Infinitely guilty. You know, we say, oh, I'm not, I'm not that bad. I'm a good person. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't commit adultery. I don't commit fornication. So I'm not a bad person. You're wicked and evil and violent in God's sight. Just one act. When Adam disobeyed God, that one act of rebellion was enough to bring about an infinite punishment before God, which is death, eternal death. That's why you're going to say, well, a baby that is just born is innocent. They are not innocent before God. They are still infinitely unworthy in God's sight because of Adam's sin. There is no sin. So you see now, there's no, there's no getting around this fact. You cannot just, as I said last week, Make sin disappear. Sin doesn't just dissolve in the air. Even in death, death doesn't take away sin from you. Remember, the body dies, but the soul and spirit still have to answer to God for its rebellion. You're always talking about it. So you can say, well, death is going to take away my, my guilt before God. No, actually it's going to magnify it because now, now you're going to actually know be in a state that you're going to be be about to be paid, paying for it. 
You're not under condemnation anymore. You see, now, when you're living, you're condemned. But there's still a, a hope or a chance that you could be redeemed. But once you die in your sin, there's no more hope for you of, re of redemption. That is the point. So death will not take away your guilt. Actually, it will not bring you to a place that you're going to pay for it. So all sin is of infinite aggravation and heinousness before God. Therefore, therefore, before the sin is justified, they are under infinite guilt in God's sight. Consider that when a person is separate from Christ. Now, we're talking about a person that is separate, separate from Christ. If any man be in Christ, what? He's a new creation. But if you're not in Christ, you are operating in yourself. That is the thing that God looks at. Either you are walking in yourself, or you're walking in Christ. Remember, as I said, we need a person of infinite worthiness to represent us before God. So when we are in Christ, Christ's worthiness is working on our behalf. God doesn't see us anymore. He sees Christ. He sees Christ's worth. He sees Christ's value. He sees the love he has for Christ. And that love and that value is then transferred to us. That is what worthiness is. Christ's worth, Christ's value, Christ's obedience, Christ's willingness being placed on our account, given to us. So then God doesn't see us in ourselves as lacking anymore. We have Christ. And if you have Christ, you have everything. That's what he said. If any man be in Christ. You see, you must be in Christ. So that is what this statement is saying. Consider when a person is separate from Christ, God considers that person as they are in themselves, and any act of goodness will not be accepted by God but must be considered along with their guilt and rebellion and both placed in the scales of justice. Let's say, in general, people have some acts of goodness in themselves. Let's put it like that, right? But the point is that your sin is of infinite, like, rebellion against God. So any goodness in you will not Benefit you because your sin will always override any goodness that you might have in you. So that's what we're talking here. So now what, what God going to do now, God is going to put both your sin and any good thing that you have in you on the scales. But because sin is infinite, the goodness in you will have no effect of mitigating or removing the sin. So the scales will always be against you. So, consider when a person is separate from Christ, God consider that person as they are in themselves, and any act of goodness will not be accepted by God, but, but must be considered along with their guilt and rebellion, and both placed together in the scales of justice. Hence, that person's goodness is of no value, since it is finite. Remember, your goodness is finite, right, Pastor? And your sin is infinite. Your guilt is infinite. So how can a finite value override an infinite value? It cannot, over, it cannot work, right? Therefore, that is the reason God cannot give the sinner any spiritual benefit from Christ as they are in themselves until they are justified in his sight. Consider that the sinner's guilt can only be removed when God pardons their sin. So now when God adds Christ's work to your value, to the scales, the scale will balance. Because Christ is of infinite worth, and it will come to act your infinite guilt. But remember, another thing too, what God does, he removed the guilt. He removed the penalty for sin. Because Christ paid for them. So now, actually, you don't have any sin anymore in, as, in God's sight. Or, or, you're not re, or you're not responsible for the sin anymore. Christ paid for it, both past, present, and future. But it doesn't mean that you must continue to sin. It doesn't mean that. It just means that you have been justified. Because justified means that the penalty for your sin has been paid for. And you have received 
a spiritual benefit which is called righteousness. We made a statement that a person's goodness, goodness is of no value since it is finite in value when placed against the infinite guilt. Now this is a simple DC circuit. We have battery power, battery, 100 volt battery, and we have some resistors, two resistors, R1 and R2. One is 99 ohms and one ohm, 100 volts. Now, whenever you connect a circuit, complete circuit, there's gonna be current flowing, which is I. Now, V is equal to voltage, measured in volts, R is resistant, measured in ohms, and I equals current, measured in amps. So I is the current flowing. This is the voltage that is applied to the circuit, and these are the resistors. Now, according to equation, or let's say physical equation, voltage is equal to current by resistance. And by mathematical calculation, Therefore, it means that current is equal to voltage divided by resistance. And resistance is equal to voltage divided by current. So, whenever you apply a voltage to a circuit, you will get current to flow. Now, as you can see that, this value of this resistor is 99 times this one. And we can say, let's say, approximately 100 times bigger than this. Now, as I say, current is equal to voltage divided by resistance. Where resistance is our total is equal to R1 plus R2. So 99 ohms plus 1 ohm is 100 ohms. So if I divide 100 by 100, it means that the current flowing through the circuit would be 1 amp. 1 amp. But since this is 99 times bigger than this, is going to take the most voltage. So it will receive 99 multiplied by 1, which is 99. And this will receive 1, 1 ohm multiplied by 1 amp is 1 volt. Now, consider this to be your sin and this to be your goodness. Now, in electronics, or uh, even in physics, whenever you compare two values and they are greater than 10 or uh, between the two, you, you, can, you, will, you will approximate. So I can look at this circuit right away and see that this resistor is 100 times, approximately 100 times bigger than this one. So in my mind, this resistor is going to get all the voltage. It's going to get 99 volt and it's going to get 1. Now, let's multiply this by 10 and make it 999. And make, make this, this, this still remains 1. So the total resistance now is 1,000. The total resistance is 1,000 ohms. Now you divide 100 by 1,000, you're going to get 0.1. That is your sin, because sin increases daily. You do not wrath upon wrath for your day of wrath. What's going to happen to this? This is going to decrease. Let's go further. Let's make it up to a million now. So make this value 999,999. The voltage is going to become... 99.999. See that? And this value is going to become 0.0001. So your sin always override your goodness. Now, let's do something else now. But you know, in my mind, I can always say, I, can, I don't even need to go to all of this. I can say to you that 
since this value is a million times bigger than this, or a thousand times bigger than this, or even a hundred times bigger than this, it's going to get all of the votes. It's going to get everything. So it's going to get 100 votes. And this, will, this one will receive nothing. So your goodness can never override your evil wickedness. But let's do something else now. Let's open up this circuit here. There's a break in the wire. That means that no current can flow. No goodness, consider this to be goodness of God, cannot reach you over here. Because there's an open circuit. This now becomes infinite. Whenever there's a break in a circuit, it means that the resistance becomes infinite. But there's no current flowing, but this voltage right here is 100 volts across this open circuit. Waiting until you connect it so that this can flow. Remember, whenever we see an equal sign, equal sign, Every value on this side must equal the value on this side. But we are approximating that this 100 volts will go here. And nothing will ever reach this resistor over here. So sin is infinite in value. Your sin is infinite in value. And this is your goodness. So when we put this in the scales of justice, this open, or this guilt, will take all of God's wrath when it's applied. No goodness can reach you. God will not consider no good that you do because of your, the infinite nature of your sin. You understand that? So sin is infinite. Nothing of God's goodness can ever reach you. Because your sin will always override any goodness in you. But remember something. Your sin will always increase in your life. But your goodness will never increase. A man doesn't become good by time. Time will not make you good. You are wicked and evil and vile before God. So, as Paul said, all you are doing, you're stirring up wrath against wrath until the day of wrath. Consider all sin is of infinite aggravation and heinousness before God. Therefore, before the sin is justified, they are under infinite guilt in God's sight. So, therefore, they are worthy of his infinite wrath. And remember, God's infinite wrath is going to be death, eternal death. The wage of sin is death. Whenever you are outside of Christ, you are under God's wrath. The only escape or avenue for us is to be in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Remember that God the Father gave us to Christ in eternity past as a charge that he would go and die for our sins. Even though we were in Christ or belong to Christ through election, when we were born, we were born under sin because of Adam's sin. So until God recovers us, we are still under his wrath. Remember Paul said that in Ephesians chapter 2, And you, he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once were, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Um, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desire of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as others. So when we were born, even though we are elect of God, we were under his wrath. We were by nature children of wrath. So we remain in that state until God recovers us, until God justifies us, until God imputes Christ. Righteousness to us. We remain on that state of judgment and condemnation. When we are separate from Christ, God considers that person 
as they are in themselves. And any act of goodness will not be accepted by God. So you want to be outside of Christ, you must be representing yourself. Whenever you are outside of Christ, you are representing yourself then. And your, and your representation is meaningless before God. You imagine you go to court, Pastor. You commit an offense, and you go to court, and you don't have an attorney, and you want to represent yourself. You don't know the law. You don't have the evidence, or you don't have witnesses. How are you going to be able to, let's say, represent yourself faithfully or, or, or in a proper manner? You'll be lacking or missing something. But we have an avenue of escape in Christ. He's our advocate. He is our redeemer. He is our counselor. He represents us before God. He's the mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So God will always consider our guilt more than our goodness. Because our guilt, as I say, is infinite. And our goodness is finite in nature. Therefore, God will not give the sinner any spiritual benefit from Christ as they are in themselves until they are justified in his sight. Consider that the sinner's guilt can only be removed by Christ pardoning our sins. Next week we're going to continue. God will not give you Christ's benefit when you are in sin. You know, like uh, we always hear people going to tell you God is going to bless you. Now remember something. God blesses us materially because he allows us to have life, have breath. He gives us food. He gives us shelter. He gives us raiment. He gives us an existence in the earth. He provides a family work. All these things. We have nature to enjoy. The sun, the moon, the stars, the rivers, the plants, the beauty of nature to enjoy. But that is not a spiritual benefit. That is a material benefit. That is God's benevolence. So God will give all those things to every single person as they live on earth. But you see now, when it comes to the things of Christ, when it comes to spiritual life, it can only come through Christ. And it only comes when we are in Christ. If any man be in Christ, when we are connected to Christ, then we have all rights. And we're going we're gonna to end on this note. Go back to Romans 5. Verse 1 and 2. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, you see that? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So we can stop there. So we have been justified by faith and it Brings about peace, reconciliation with God. And, and then what does verse 2 say? Trum whom, also trum Christ, we have access by faith into grace. The grace of God has been shed abroad in our lives by the Holy Spirit. God's grace is reaching us through faith. We have access into God's grace. We are standing under God's grace. We are standing in God's grace. We are operating in God's grace. We are operating in God's goodness now. We have fellowship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the flesh of the Holy Spirit is operating with us now and forevermore. So we want you to understand that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And because of the word of God, we have received faith. And we are talking now that because of this faith, we have received Christ's righteousness. So that is why we say the righteousness of faith. Having therefore been justified by faith, having therefore received Christ's righteousness by faith, we have peace with God. And God now sees us as worthy. First we were unworthy, now we are worthy. First we were unbelieving, now we believe. First we didn't have any hope, now we have hope. So may God bless and keep you. Hold on to Jesus. He is the one. Through him, we live 
and move and have all being. May God bless and keep you. In Jesus' name, amen.